Jordan. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Habitat Now. It has been a long time since I've seen your faces as of last year. I took some time off with the family, and I'm sure you did too. I hope you've had some great holidays and great New Year's with family and friends. And I'm looking forward to seeing you again as we continue these Habitat Zooms every single Saturday that I can get to it. It is a lot of fun, and I love doing it and supporting the arts and the community that we all know and love. Uh, I have the honor today of joining, uh, having us join uh, Pearl Dick from her studio in, in Chicago, Illinois. Um, she is our first presenter in 2022's Not Grandma's Glass presentation, focused on artworks that are not in Grandma's art collection yet. Now, what's very interesting is we picked the winners, many of you have seen from the first year's exhibition, and they are on the website um, announcing the winners, which is, let me try it off the top of my head, Morgan Peterson, John Moran, Joel Ivacek and Krista Israel. It was a panel in the gallery of uh, myself, Ferdinand and Corey Hampson that decide on the winners. And next year, I'm trying to get some guest judges together to help us choose for 2022. Um, that aside, I'm gonna take over your screen and start showing my little cute PowerPoint I put together here. So here's our title card, America's first contemporary glass art gallery. We're gonna be going through a little rebranding too. You might notice we're going to be called Habitat Detroit Fine Art, just to associate ourselves beyond a lot of the glass artists that we represent um, use mixed media anyway. And I feel that adding the fine art really helps in the narrative of the gallery. So uh, first off, our Masterworks auction is online uh, with 47, I believe, pieces available to the highest bidder. Auction catalog should be reaching your uh, mailbox is soon. If you don't, if you don't get one, email me or call me, and you can see the auction online entirely. On uh, I think it's on habitatglass.com, or you know, we can check our website habitat.com. There's a link there. Sarasota uh, in Saint Petersburg. So our Glass Coast weekend is still going forward. We're real excited to be down in Florida, especially leaving from Michigan where it's freezing, and we have a lot of people sign up and a good amount of artists coming down. And I just wanted to go over quickly before we give Pearl the floor. Uh, the exhibitions that are on display. The first one is called Beyond the Ceiling, Influential Women of Studio Glass. There's about 25 women in this exhibition and uh, it's gonna be an impressive one. And I'm looking forward to sharing um, this exhibition with you. Next, we have Aquatica, Glass Beneath the Waves. About 30 artists who are inspired by the aquatic world, whether it's terrain, life, uh, you know, coral, nature, everything that's on there. It's gonna be quite an amazing show. We have uh, a good collection of artists and some new, that I've never shown before in some of our Inhabitat families. Last is a solo show by Shelly Mazaloski allen out of Seattle. It's a show called Harbor. She'll be showing about maybe six or seven works in the exhibition. This is a brand new piece. You're the first one to see it. This is like a pony size, almost life size of a pony. And she has other works that will be on display too. You might see in your email coming up, but you're obviously welcome to come see them. And last, we're gonna be visiting the Imagine Museum, celebrating the, uh, it's called the Age of Glass, celebration honoring Martin Blank. So he'll be down there along with the other artists. So hope you make it, we'd love to see you. If not, we'll be doing a virtual Zoom also down from down there. Um, this is kind of the stuff I already covered. So I'll kick through this one. So I just wanna talk about the location real quick. It's gonna be at the Ringling College of Art and Design on campus at a place called Studio Lab A. It's, it's an amazing soundstage that we're gonna be converting into a gallery. Uh, we'll have COVID protocols in place, making sure everybody who comes has the vaccine, masks are required, hand sanitizer will be provided, the whole spiel. And uh, there'll be space, you can, there's a bus provided, people can drive themselves. Um, being in Florida also helps, the weather's fantastic. Here's a list of the artists that are coming, Shelly Allen, uh, Deanna Clayton, I spelled wrong, uh, Eakin and Josh Davids from Kalamazoo, Susan Taylor Glasgow, Kathy Mulcahy, Jenny Pullman, Sabrina Knowles, Kate Rhodes, Marlena Rose, Stephanie Trenchard, Alex Bernstein, Martin Blank, Latches of Voyage of and Michael Taylor. Visit, you can RSVP with me, Debbie, or the website. So I look forward to seeing you all then. And then just so you have the dates for Art International, um, covering for the first time now, celebrating the Year of Glass in April. It's the last weekend in April. We'll be doing uh, something very similar if you always done. This will be our 50th year doing it, which is insane. So you're welcome to that too. So back to Grandma's Glass. Again, 12 months celebrating in, war, in uh, uh, Pearls, our very first artist like Morgan Peterson last year, it's very um, exceptional and, and important for her to go first. And I wanna celebrate what she does. Uh, let me kick out of my little presentation here and stop sharing my screen so uh, Pearl can take over. Go ahead, Pearl, go ahead and start sharing your screen. <coughs> and Thank then, you. And obviously you're welcome. Pearl, you know, Pearl focuses beyond artists in her community and philanthropy. And it's, it's a very impressive thing to do while 
being a full-time artist too. It's incredibly challenging and it must be rewarding. So thanks for being here, Pearl, and say hello to everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks everybody for joining me on this Saturday. I hope everyone is well, happy, wherever you are. I see some familiar faces, which is awesome. Um, yeah, we're we're pretty chilly up here in Chicago, so so I'm glad you're you're gonna be doing your thing down in Florida. That's that'll be nice for folks to get to get a little break from this. Yes, you're invited to Pearl. Come on down. <laughs> I you know I I would love to. I would love to. We'll see what see what we got on the schedule. But I I see the folks that you got coming down. It's like great group of people, the artists and. You guys will have a great time and I'm glad that you're going to get a little R and R too. Hopefully is yeah. part of it. Whole family's coming down. So we're gonna make the best of it. Awesome. Awesome. Well, well thank you guys all for, for being here. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to start my, my slideshow and, you know, honestly, like, like I'm fine. If anybody has questions or comments or, you know, wants to like say anything during feel free to jump in and, I don't, I don't know if Aaron, if you've got control of mute or not, but. Everybody can control their own mute. So everybody okay. has the, their handle on it by now. They're all Zoom pros here. We're Zoom pros. Yep. Yeah, yep. I'm, I'm super happy to like, you know, chat with folks during. So don't be shy. <laughs> if, if you got any a question that pops in your mind or comment or criticism, whatever it is. <laughs> right. Okay. Hey, Judy. Sounds good. Good to see you. <laughs> see you guys. All right. Let me see if I can figure out how to do this. Um, oh. I'll, 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 while you're figuring it out, I'll have a dialogue with people. So we have um, Pearl's uh, presentation up on artsy.net. So I will be sharing that in the link of the chat and obviously be sending it to you guys later. I'm going to be continuing setting up for my boy's birthday party. So maybe later on tonight, but oh, good. Pearl, you're already ready to go. Let's do this. I'm ready to go. Um, so this is my mom and me and my little brother. Um, my, I'm, I'm starting here because I owe so much to my mom as, as many of us do. Um, but she's, she's a first generation Chinese immigrant. Uh, she came to the States um, fleeing the cultural revolution in China. And, and you know, it's been an incredible uh, support for me throughout my life in my chosen, my, my career choice of being an artist. Um, she's a retired nurse. So, you know, also where I believe I get a lot of my desire to be helpful and in service to other folks. She's probably one of the most generous and kind people I know. Um, so I just wanted to do a little shout out to my mom. And, you know, my dad's no slouch either. It's just me and him. And uh, it's his family's like super fun, super creative, um, both musically and, and in the visual arts. And I've always been encouraged to to make art and play music and, and be creative. And so, you know, I really owe a lot to them and, and they never batted an eyelash when I told them, hey, I'm gonna go to art school, <laughs> knowing full well that they might be supporting me for the rest of my life, which <laughs> thankfully, you know, we're, we're good, but they've been a huge, huge support and my biggest fans. So shout out to them. They were hippies too, if you can't tell. Um, so I, I sculpt heads mostly like I'm so the art that I make very often um you know are, are sculpted faces and heads um of of all of the like you know physical body parts the head for me is always kind of embodied like like a whole person like a soul a personality um individuals uh and um that's yeah the 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 thing that I've always kind of gone to, I mean, people have always been what has inspired me and um, I've always drawn faces. I've always like sculpted faces and, and people, um, you know, some people focus on like the natural world or, you know, all sorts of, you know, geometry, whatever, you know, all the different ways that people express themselves. I've, I've always been interested in people and I've always e expressed people. Um, this is my very first show of Glass Heads. This was probably back in like 2004, three, four, five. This is at, uh, in Highland Park, Illinois, uh, Danny Martyr Studio Making Glass. I had just moved to Chicago. 
Um, and I was, I was making these, these heads and, um, I mean, like I sold out the show. I mean, granted, I think I had those things for sale for like a hundred dollars or something, but, um, I really, I was struck by when people came to the show, they really gravitated to specific pieces. Like they, they, they chose pieces or pieces chose them. And, and I, I was really struck by like how people related to certain things and for certain reasons, you know, certain memories that they invoked. And, and I really love that. I love how people were drawn to specific pieces. Um, I mean, I've been sculpting heads for a long time. This is the first head I ever made um, back at Alfred University where I went to school. And it, like, there's all these little heads. Like, so I was always sculpting these tiny little blobby heads. Um, and I put them all around on this giant head. This was probably the first like ambitious piece that I did. It required like a bunch of hands in the studio. I had like 13 of my classmates bringing these heads over and it was big and way heavier and hotter than I could really manage. But, you know, it was, it was fun. It was dynamic. It's one of the pieces that really got me like excited about like all the energy that happens in a hot shop, you know, um, it's called influence. And I still have this somewhere. It's like in a box somewhere, but yeah, it's my first head ever. So all those heads were connected hot, not laminated together. They're all, Oh yeah, of course they're connected. <laughs> it was a crazy, it was crazy. There were kids running around, you know, with like, right. you know, punties and hot glass and it was just super fun it was super fun it's you know it kind of embodies what I love about the energy in the hot shop that piece um th those early heads were super rudimentary you know but I I feel like they were pretty expressive mm -hmm. and I started you know experimenting with putting things together in groupings um seeing you know how pieces kind of spoke to each other um uh, my my first love is was painting. You know, I I was actually a painter when I first moved to Chicago. There were really no glass studios here, or none that would answer my calls. Um, so, and that was around maybe two thousand three, and I was like, okay, I'll just I'll go back to painting. This I I put this one up here as kind of an interesting story. The um, this was based on an article that I had read about how in like Siberia. And like places where there's like really low sunlight, like th like children would actually be stunted if they didn't have enough like sunlight and vitamin D. So they would like gather them around in their underwear with these special glasses around these like like vitamin D lamps. I just thought it was really cool and eerie. And so here's an example of one of my paintings. Uh, I've seen that in the hospital where they uh, expose children to lots of light and cover yeah. their eyes for health reasons. Yeah, need to get rid of that thing where the I can't remember what it's called, where the children have too much pigment of orange in their skin. When they're it's like a scale of one to ten, it's very interesting. The jaundice? Yeah, it's like a yeah jaundice type thing, but it's a name for it. I can't remember what it's called, but yeah, a certain amount of level. Is, there's like a certain level where kids on a scale of one to five, and if if the kid is under a certain level, they put them in a. It's kind of it's kind of the family can only be so close, but they put them in a basically a clear box. What is it, Mary? You're a, doctor, you're a nurse. Yeah, hyperbilirubinemia. That's what it wow. is. I, I never would have said that. <laughs> no, I never, I never, I don't think I could still say it. Thank you. <laughs> Former nurse. Yay. Right. Yay. Thank you, Mary. Good knowledge. Love me here. some nurses. So, so I've, I've always in, incorporated paintings. Like I still do paintings. In fact, I'm sitting in kind of like what has become my painting studio. I've got like paints all around me right now. Um, but I, I was always incorporating paint in my work and um i had actually i was working on these like these are paradise paints this is a series called running girls and this is actually the same piece just two sides mm -hmm. of it and it was um i love the way that you could like you know get imagery in the round um you know layered imagery in this way mm -hmm. and this piece was actually about um having this you know being told as a girl to like be a certain type of way you know to be polite to be demure to like sit still, you know, to behave. And then inside there was like this raging, like, you know, wild woman that's like struggling to get out. That that's me. Um, so this, this was a series from that. Um, and I, I had actually, like some of you guys who are from Chicago might remember Kraft Lieberman Gallery. Um, so Jeff Kraft, I actually brought these pieces and some of my heads um, to, to his gallery, like old school. Like, I think I had like a box and I just walked in and I was showing him these pieces. He didn't like the the painted pieces, but he loved the heads. Um, so ended up 
kind of pushing me more in that direction. This is a super old piece that Aaron dug up, which um, so that's it's part of why I'm showing it. But this shows a little bit of the process. That's um, Ben Tolman in that photo and Drew Helge, both are who are accomplished artists in their own right these days. But um, yeah, this is the process of, of how I'd make these guys back in the day. It was real fast and loose. And what I got was what I got. There was really very little control. Um, it kind of just I'd throw these things together and some of them worked out great. Some of them right at the last minute wouldn't, you know? So it was like, it was all about the moment and, and it was real crapshoot, honestly. Um, so, you know, that's an example of how I would make this type of piece. And I really loved the way the glass would just like mold together. It, you know, like when I mashed these together hot, they would just, um, they would bond, they'd become indelibly part of each other, it really spoke to me about relationships and how we connect with each other. Um, I just love that quality of glass and how I could, like, how I could do that. Hey, Pearl? Yeah. Pearl, hi. Um, so I assume you're blowing these pieces. Yeah, yes. And, so and, and do you then shape the faces by um, polishing, using polishing tools? How does she do? How do you get the, the beautiful features? Sure. Um, so they are blown. Um, they, uh, so I'll go back to this one. So you can see like the bottom, like where the, the neck is, that's where they're attached to the pipe. And um, I sculpt the features with different tools, tweezers, tagliole, um, like I have, you know, diamond shears, like all the different glass tools that, you know, that we all use. Um, with the addition of my favorite tool, which is a butter knife, which is a great tool for sculpting all the little fine details. Um, and then I go in and I, I powder, um, use like a fine glass color, sift it on and then wipe it away. And it stays in those lines and makes them look like they're drawn on. And I use those powdered colors a lot to get like different um, effects. Like you can see the shading on the, on the head on the left. Um, so I'll wipe the powder away before it's completely melted in. And that's how I get those effects. Hi guys. Um, that's how I get the drawings. So, yeah. So Pearl, the, the, all, all of the shaping is done while it's hot. Yes. You, you, you're, not, you're not doing any polishing when it's cooled down to room temperature. Only at the very bottoms of the necks. So I'll, I'll usually cut those on a saw and then polish those. Um, so, you know, just where right. it's flat. Um, but no, yeah, all, all of the features, all of the color application, all of the contours, it's all done hot. Amazing. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for the question. Um, some of these pieces I did, you know, I incorporated like my drawings, dreams, memories. Um, and, and again, I would like, carve into the surface of the glass, I would sprinkle some powder and then I'd wipe it away and it would stay into those in those crevices. These pieces are more about like when I get in my own head, which is something that's necessary when you're kind of out there a lot, you know, and especially in a in a glass studio, you're typically working with other people. So it's very different from painting in that way. Painting, you can be really solitary. You can really be in your own mind. Um, and these were some pieces that I did to kind of reflect that in the studio in the hot shop then of course I always go back to like community <laughs> and like you know installations lots of pieces together this is the first piece I ever showed at sofa I think the first sofa I ever showed at was in like 2005 and it was called connections um and again Jeff Kraft uh you know gave me my first kind of big shot um took a real gamble I mean you guys know what those booths cost at sofa what it takes to like put them up and he let me have a whole front facing wall. Nobody knew who I was. I do remember feeling very um, unworthy as I was like installing my installation. I worked really hard on this. I was really, really excited about it. I, I went all through the gamut of emotions in making this piece. Um, and uh, I remember putting it up and I was looking around, you know, at the other artists around me and just feeling very unworthy. Like there was some amazing artists, all of the folks that you guys know and collect, um, some of the folks who are on this call, actually, I saw Sabrina and Jenny jump on. Um, I mean, I just was like, wow, these, these are the people that I have studied and admire, and here I am with them. So it's a real honor to be there and show this piece. 
Um, this is a piece called Spectrum. This was at, at the time it was Habitat Gallery, but became Karen X Studio in, in downtown Chicago. Um, yeah, this piece was, it, it was a real trial to make. It was like, it looks really jolly and happy, but it almost killed me. Um, I, I don't know what happened. Maybe somebody like dropped out of a show or something, but I, she offered me a solo show. And again, this is early on in my career. And um, I, I had like three months to make this solo show. And of course I'm like, I'm gonna just make a million things. And, um, you know, and yeah, so I went and sculpted 118 of these glass heads. Um, I just really got into this place of like a euphoric, like just like I was working so much and so hard and, and so many hours. I just, it really took me to this interesting place as an artist. <laughs> It was, um, yeah, it was kind of, kind of mad for a while, like, like crazy mad, insane mad. But I was really happy with how this came out and it really spoke to like things that really meant a lot to me, um, you know, unity and diversity and inclusion and tolerance and beauty. And um, I had somebody come and see this piece and they told me that they cried a little bit and I was really flattered and honored. Um, they thought it was beautiful. Um, and I don't think you can see it in this slide, but on the wall I had written um, by looking into each other's faces, we can see ourselves. Um, and that has always been like a big theme and thought for me that, you know, we connecting with each other is, is important for so many reasons, but it's, it's a really powerful way for us to understand ourselves and our place in the world and um, with humanity and in the natural world. Um, so I did a whole series of these pieces, which you can see behind Aaron. <laughs> um, um, these are actually all clear glass with like a mirrorizing solution to make them reflective. And I, you can see your face in them. Like you literally walk up to these and you can see yourself looking at these pieces. Um, and that was really literally embodying that idea I just spoke of. So, so that's my that's my work and we'll get back into a couple more things that are a little more recent a little bit later but uh, as Aaron mentioned like the other big part of my work is is my community service my my activism working with young people um in 2006 um a friend of mine ha had a really tragic accident he was just about to start a glass program with our, our good friend Mike Bancroft and uh, cooperative image group and uh, he was injured. He couldn't start this program. So he asked me to step in at the last minute. I had never taught. I had no aspirations to teach. I hadn't lived in Chicago for a long time. I moved here from Portland, Oregon. I grew up in Connecticut. I didn't know what the West side of Chicago was all about. Um, I didn't know how to teach. I didn't know anything about kids. And it was the first time I, I ever had the opportunity to, to kind of explore all of these things. And I just fell in love. Um, this is a group of young people that I worked with. We had zero budget. We didn't blow glass. We had no studio. We found pieces of glass in a dumpster, like we painted on them. Um, we, this is a park, a park in Humboldt Park on the west side of Chicago, pretty rough neighborhood. And this park was really blighted. There would be hypodermic needles everywhere. There were shootings that happened. It was on a corner in a residential neighborhood, but it was just a real sore spot in the community. And we took it over and cleaned it up. We planted a community garden. We made this glass walkway, which is still there today with all of our images, um, mosaics and positive um, messages. And we, we made these uh, concrete benches that people could sit on and enjoy the park. Um, neighbors would you know, run electricity out for us to like use our mixers and tools and like people were just really excited. We were doing this in the neighborhood and it was really awesome. You know, it's, it's always great when you get like young people working with power tools, you know? Um, so we had some, some great opportunities to like go into neighborhoods, clean them up, fix them up. Like the young people were able to like contribute to the beautification of their own spaces, which is really powerful. Um, and, and work together, work together for ideas with ideas. Um, and, and make these really cool projects uh, that then exist in, in the public space. This piece is at the Chicago Community Trust here. This is huge, it's big it's mosaic and fused glass and blown glass and painted glass um, depicting our city. 
So this is another turning point. This is Dr. Lisa McQueen. She's an emergency room pediatric physician at Comer Children's Hospital on the south side of Chicago. Um, this, is a, this is the level one trauma unit that young people go to when they're injured. Um, on the south side, people are injured a lot there. Um, she's the first person they see when she's you know, in charge of the emergency room there in, in pediatrics. And as you can imagine, it's a really stressful job. Um, she came in and took a glass blowing workshop with me and she just like fell in love and she would have so much fun. She came in, she'd come in in her lab jacket on her lunch breaks and just mess around. She was also super type A, so she loved glass. She really loved like, you know, this challenge of it. She tried to make a perfect cup, you know, um, but it, she found it to be really healing for her, for the trauma of her job. And she, um, she, oh, here, this is, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but it's like, she was very, like you, you think about the trauma, it's not just having somebody who's, who comes in and they're injured in the moment, but it's the fact that people kept coming back in. Like, she's like, I would, they would come in, I would stitch them up I'd send them back out and they'd come right back in injured worse, or somebody else would be injured because of, you know, what happened to cause that first injury. And it's just this vicious cycle until somebody dies or goes to jail. And she was seeing this happening every day. Um, and it's just, it, you can imagine how, um, you know, how hard that would be. So she, um, there was this uh, organization she told me about Healing Hurt People Chicago, their uh, hospital-based violence intervention program. That's Andy um, there. And they have uh, trauma intervention specialists, that they're called, that go into hospitals and people are injured and they offer options for follow-up care, mental health support, wraparound services, you know, family supports. Um, and, and in our case, which I think I'm getting to, um, this is Dr. Brad Stolbach. He's the clinical director. Um, I love showing this picture of him because, you know, he's like, he's like this, you know, professional, but he's also super goofy. Lisa McQueen introduced me to him and we conceived of Project FIRE. So Project FIRE, um, you know, FIRE stands for Fearless Initiative for Recovery and Empowerment. And, and that little postcard on the left, that's like one of our first postcards we designed. It has all the the words that start with F that you know we thought embodied, we settled on fearless um, initiative for recovery empowerment. So it's it's a it, the idea was is that not only would it offer um, healing, uh, so like it would have the wraparound mental health and wellness services, but people could learn a craft, they could they could learn an art form, um, talk about expression, and it was a job opportunity for folks. So we created conceived of and created this program, Project FIRE. Let's let y'all read this. So I, I don't know how many of you all, well, I, was, I don't know how many of y'all watch the news, but I'm sure you've heard about, um, you know, some of the stuff that happens in Chicago, all the shootings. And what I was particularly struck by was um, how young people were, like how many young people were being injured. Um, I mean, the, when I read this statistic, it just blew my mind, you know? Um, yeah, these are, these are kids that are out there um, getting killed and killing each other. And they're largely young black kids. We have a huge problem here in Chicago. We, we, it was bad then, it's still bad now. Um, I saw an option to do something, hopefully that could be helpful. And that's where Project Fire comes in. Um, there's all sorts of um, adversity that people face in this city, and we wanted to present an opportunity for people to have another option. So these two guys on the left is Nkosi Barber, and the right is Andrew Nesbitt, Neswick. Um, Kosi I met in when he was in high school, Little Black Pearl, and I remember being struck by his piece that he made. It's a fist with barbed wire around it, and I took that picture. He's such a baby there, and I, I remembered him from that, and um, Andrew, he, he'd been shot when he was 13 in the head, um, and he, he was in a coma for like eight months. He um, is basically paralyzed on one side of his body, almost as if he had a stroke as a result of his in injury. His grandmother, so she's pictured up at the top, Grandma Noreen, called up the studio I was at at the time, Chicago Hot Glass, and explained 
you know, what Andrew's injuries were and the fact that he woke up from his coma and all he wanted to do is blow a glass. I'm not sure where he got this in his mind. I don't know why, but he just wanted to blow glass. And um, so they call up the studio and they explain it. And somebody's like, go talk to Pearl. And so of course I'm like, yeah, of course I want to blow glass with this guy. And that was, that was like 15 years ago. He still comes in, he still blows glass. So long story short, I tapped these two guys to come in and help um, be my new assistant teachers to this program. Um, so the first thing was, you know, teaching them how to teach. This is our first cohort of Project Fire. Um, it, this was this was it to start with. We had one trauma intervention specialist, Artisha Williams, and um, me and Brad, and the teaching artists, and these four guys. Um, so so this. So all of that was happening. I, I was at different studios. Um, when I really started working with this population of young person, I quickly realized that we needed our own space to do this work. Um, we needed to be feel comfortable. We needed to feel like it was our space. We needed to be able to do what we wanted to do. We didn't need people looking at us sideways if somebody walked in with an ankle bracelet or didn't act the way somebody thought they should act. So I rage built my own studio in that firehouse <laughs> that you just saw. Um, literally built it from scratch in about five months um, with a lot of help from my artist friends. It's the first time I ever built a furnace from scratch. Um, we had no, very little money. Um, so we built it all ourselves. Um, and it was a great learning process. It was a lot of work, um, but I, I knew we needed to do this to house this program. Um, and uh, yeah, I had a lot of help from, from folks that, you know, would volunteer their time, um, you know, people in the community, Aaron Wolf Bowes, um, you know, really did a lot of this work and that's, that's him. You can't even see him, but, you know, building our benches, like we built every single aspect of it from scratch. Um, and we created a functioning hot glass studio. I mean, I don't know if you guys can see in that photo, but like there's actually a leaf blower that's duct taped onto that glory hole, <laughs> eating it up. Um, it was real rudimentary. Our ventilation were box fans in these windows. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was really rough. The floor, this firehouse was built in 1873 and um, the floor was not at all even. It was just all over the place, but we made it work. And um, it was, a really, really special thing. Um, it was our space. Young people were, were like comfortable there. You know, it was like a clubhouse. Um, you know, we had animals, we had like, you know, running around. It was just a real um, beautiful space to be. And um, we were able to, to do some really great bonding there, some really great programming. And this is really where Project Fire was born. Um, and to see young people working in the space together, to see them blowing glass and like expressing themselves, um, you know, it was just so great. You see my open toolbox in the background, like that's just how it was. I like, I had my glass blowing tools, you know, I got stainless steel pipes and cut them down um, for blow pipes. You know, we, we did what we had to do. These, this is, uh, these are two twins. This is Trevelli and Trevello. Um, we had meals, like we feed people in Project Fire, um, we get people transportation. It's really like a big family. Babies are born. <laughs> we just had a baby born on the 24th of December. Um, baby Amir is a, is a brand new Project Fire member. That's Lyric right there. She's four weeks old in that picture. We do a lot of work with veterans. Um, there's just a real special bond that happens with veterans and with the young people that I work with. So everybody in Project Fire has been shot. Um, it's, it's part of the unfortunate <laughs> prerequisite of this program is that you have yourself been violently injured. Um, and people, um, people in the service and then these young people in the streets of Chicago actually have a lot to bond over. Um, and we love working with veterans and they love working with us. It's like a real match made in heaven. It was a real fun time. Um, and we outgrew that pretty fast. So we were at the firehouse for about three and a half years. And then um, uh, one of our board members is in real estate and bought this building knowing that we were maxing out our firehouse um, and we could do whatever we wanted to, to this building. This is in East Garfield Park um, on Lake Street. 
we could paint on this thing. We could like, we could do whatever we wanted here. It was our really like our space and much bigger. We could build it out to suit. When we were at that firehouse, I couldn't, um, it was like historic. And the landlord at the time was like real, like didn't want to mess with anything. So I couldn't even drill into walls. Like I had to build structures to put like break off boxes on the wall. But here we could build out rooms. You know, we could like, we, we put in like, you know, ventilation. We could like, we ran all of our own electrical the way that we needed. This is actually our executive director, Karen Ray is like running electrical. You know, we all came together once again and built this thing. Um, this is in probably 2015. Um, the young people built the space, you know, they, they put up the drywall. And, and this is way before masks were cool, by the way, you guys, we've been wearing those N95s forever. So again, this is Ancosi, um, you know, we've truly built the space ourselves. Um, we go to art fairs and, um, you know, sidewalk sales and continue to sell our work. We've sent folks to Corning Museum of Glass. There's actually one young person that's in this picture who, um, Brianna Stampley, who's right above me in a blue shirt. Um, they, they went to Corning with me as a young person and took classes with me at the firehouse. And then got a scholarship to study glass at University of Wisconsin Madison um, with Helen Lee. Graduated this year and is now working full time for us uh, teaching. So, full circle, super cool. Um, you know, victory. We went to Wheaton Village and um, presented at Glass Weekend. Um, we've taken people on planes for the very first time. This is Trevelli again. We went to a thing called Peace Builders Camp just outside of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, this is a really cool thing. Um, they, they do this, uh, this camp for young people where they talk about social justice issues, but they also do all the camp stuff too. You know, they go swimming and, you know, they camp and play, you know, play. They get to be kids. This is me and Trevelli. And, and we went down in Blue Glass and talked to them about Project Fire. Um, we've gone there for the past couple of years uh, or pre-COVID. Um, this is us at the uh, Civil Rights Museum Atlanta, which was an incredibly moving thing for both Trevelli and I to go through together. Um, we've, we speak at conferences all the time, Project Fires, you know, we were often guest speakers. We were a keynote speaker with Dr. Brad Stolbach here um, in Chicago um, about, you know, how to be resilient in the face of the, um, you know, violence that's happening in Chicago and, and things that you can do, um, you know, to help We've been to Alaska, we've been to, this is in uh, New York, um, talk to young people about voting, you know, exercising their rights, you know, it's like, it, and, and this wasn't even like a big election, I, you know, like, and I remember I was giving people extra credit. I was like, if you vote, you get extra credit, whatever, whatever I bribed them with that year, I don't remember, but this was even like, this was like a Chicago midterm or something. And I was talking to them about judges and about laws. And like, you know, if you want to see things changed, this is one way to do it. You know, don't just complain about it. Get out there and do it. We, we've been getting people vaccinated, um, you know. So it's, it's not obviously all about teaching people to be glass artists um, or even about the paycheck that they get, which is something, you know, but it's really about being a part of a community. Um, really proud of this. We started... Um, we started a, a cohort just for young women um, in 2019, right before the pandemic hit. And um, it had previously been all young men in our program because of the nature of like the, you know, like there were more young men getting shot, unfortunately, and then wanting to be in our program. And, and equally, unfortunately, that's been shifting. And there are more and more young women who are in this, in this um, position as well. So we had enough people to actually form their own group. And man, these women are just remarkable and they've been absolutely crushing it. Like all the guys knew coming in, they're like, uh oh, like the girls are going to, you know, really blow us out of the water. And they were right. They absolutely did. Um, here we are making masks. They're just, they're so incredible and it's like so strong and have really just like made our studio just that much more dynamic. Um, incredible artists. Um, so this, this is a series that I did called Bloom and Grow. Um, and it was really very much uh, influenced by this work that I came to with young people um, and, and how we 
influence each other, how we help each other grow, how we create beauty um, together. And I, I have the young folks in our program learn how to make these flowers. And then, you know, so they sculpt a bunch of flowers and then we all work together to put them on um, one of the heads. So we've, we've been working on this, this series for a bit. And I, I really just, I love the way these, um, they really represent what it feels like to be a teacher um, and, and somebody, you know, like somebody in, in the community that, um, I guess in the role that I feel in, the, in our community. So there's some of these pieces. Um, I This is at uh, the Museum of Glass in Tacoma. I was part of a show, um, the first LGBTQIA plus glass show somehow. Um, <laughs> I'm surprised that it was the first, um, but I, I had a couple pieces in this show. Um, this is one of the pieces in the show, it's called Us. And then this is a piece called Guide. And again, love that I can like incorporate paintings and installation. Um, while I was there for that show, I was invited to come out and do a visiting artist residency at the Museum of Glass. And I mean, I don't know, I hope everybody in this call has been to the Museum of Glass. This place is absolutely amazing. Um, and as a glass artist, you get to go out there and work with like this incredibly skilled team to make whatever your heart's desire is. I don't have finished pieces of these yet because they're actually still in Tacoma. Um, and this residency got delayed. Like it was supposed to happen in 2020, like everything, it was canceled. Um, but I got to go this past July and it was like, it was such an incredible experience um, to get to go out there and just be an artist and to like take all of these influences and all of this experience and all this passion, all this love and get to like go and work with this incredible team. Um, that's Sarah Gilbert, um, Gabe Feenan, and Ben Cobb. I mean, these guys just, they're unreal. And it was so fun. This is a, a quintuple in Calmo that's truly taller than Sarah. And she's getting this thing hot and whipping it around. Like I came in there with just a sketchbook full of ideas and these guys figure out how to make it work. I mean, it's stuff I never would have been able to make anywhere else. Um, and at some point, these finished pieces will be up on my website. But like I said, I don't have them yet. They're still back in Tacoma and uh, they're being cold worked and they'll be shipped out. And um, but this this really, truly was an incredible experience. Just a few. These still have. So these will get cut off at the bottom um, and the punties at the top will get taken off, too. Um, I did a series of, uh, I did one of the flower pieces and, and I had like, so I, you would get to go in for like an eight hour day. So I'd go in in the morning for like three hours, you take a, or three or four hours, take a lunch break. And then you get like three or four hours in the afternoon. One of my days I had guest artists come in and everybody made flowers. And it was just this really fun thing. Like everybody was kind of like, you know, joyful and doing their thing and playing around. It was really lovely. And then the second half of the day, we put them all together. Um, and this piece is, is going to stay in the uh, museum's permanent collection. Again, not cold worked. It'll still get chopped off at the bottom and polished. And so that'll be there in, in their space. Um, I, think we're, I think we're getting towards the end here, you guys. Bear with me. Any questions so far? Doing great. I'm enjoying this. I'm learning a lot. Cool. So the era of Zoom, pandemic. I have a question. Sure. When you have the two heads touching, are they separate or together? Uh, they're together. So it's one piece. It's one piece. Okay. Uh, and we devised a really particular way. Remember early in like the, the slides, I had a picture of me like, you know, stabbing two heads together on pipes with somebody else. Um, it's real fast and loose. Like that's how I'd make them. I'd put them together and then I have to break them off right then and have to put it away right then. And it was real dodgy, like, you know, that connection's really fragile, um, making sure the heats were even, you know, making sure it came together the way I wanted. It was all really, you know, hard to control. And these guys helped me figure out a new way to make these pieces after making heads for 20 years, you know, like they taught me a brand new way this July. It was like mm -hmm. mind blowing um, of how to put these things together in a way that I could control it better um, and, and have like, you know, more, um, just the more security in the process. It's really amazing. Thank you. 
You're welcome. Thank you for the question. Um, this was a whole lot of my teaching life as many of us, um, you know, we've all been like on zoom. I don't know how it was never in my life before because now it feels like it's there's not a day that goes by I'm not on a zoom call. And it was always like, the, and so our young kids like we had to keep people connected. And this was a way that we had through pandemic. Um, I mean, we did go and we dropped, we still kept everybody paid, all of our staff, all of our young people, we dropped off food and supplies, PPE, um, like personal hygiene stuff, baby stuff, you know, we were going and doing drops um, regularly. And we were checking in uh, two, three times a week via Zoom. And we would have these lessons that we would do um, via Zoom. And mostly it was me looking at like a bunch of black boxes here. I would always be like, okay, guys, turn, can you turn on your cameras? But you know how it is at any rate. Um, we, uh, we did demonstrations, like one or two of us in the studio, um, you know, making stuff. And then this was actually like a screenshot of, of a girl who was um, on Zoom, you know, and then she sent it to me. Uh, we still continued programming all through pandemic. Um, and we actually embarked on a new project. This is one we're working on right now. Um, and I just got a grant from the Corning Museum of Glass too, um, which we're working in conjunction with to do this. We're creating um, glass markers to go into city sidewalks in the city of Chicago um, to commemorate people that were killed during the Chicago race riot. Um, so we're making you know, glass castings, we're writing information. These are still prototypes, but um, we're, we're writing the information um, about the people that were killed. So the Chicago race riot of 1919 was one of the most violent um, incidents of of racial unrest in the city's history. And a lot of people, even from Chicago, don't even know about it. It's rarely taught in schools. Um, so we're working with a group that is bringing awareness to what happened, because really that, um, that started a lot of the policies that are happening today, um, redlining and like some, some of the, uh, you know, the segregation that, you know, is really problematic about Chicago originated from this, very uh, brutal, tragic event. And it started when a young man, Eugene Williams, was, um, was killed. He was, um, it was a hot summer day. He was uh, swimming out in Lake Michigan and he floated over into the white part of the beach and fully adult men like threw rocks at him, hit him, he drowned. And it sparked this unrest. Um, the, the, the person was never prosecuted, even though there were tons of witnesses. They all saw who did it. They saw that it was um, that it was a murder, and when the city did nothing about it, people went crazy, and and um, you know neighborhoods were like burned down, and like there was a, a host of violence all around the city, and um, so we were creating these pieces to commemorate um, that violence and those people that were killed, um, and to bring awareness to it, and. Um, we also, so this summer, we, we hosted a beach day for young people. This is a few feet from where this happened, where Eugene Williams was murdered um, by the 31st Street Beach on the South Side. And as we've been talking to young people about this history, um, we also wanted to like celebrate people having access to, to the beach and, and to have fun and to be like, kids and to swim, you know? And um, so we got volunteers who taught swimming lessons, got us all, you know, uh, beach towels and we took people bathing suit shopping. Um, you know, we got people like uh, hair caps and goggles and we had like a whole beach day with our whole staff and with all the Project Fire young people. We visited the marker, the one marker that exists of you where Eugene Williams was killed. Here we're taking somebody's extensions out so she can swim. And uh, this is our crew on the beach. So, you know, we're able to, to talk about our history, make it relevant to today, and also still um, kind of like, I guess, subvert some of the things that happened from this violent past um, to make it right today. So that's what this beach event was all about. And um, yeah, at the end of the day, it's really, it's just about community. Um, we've got a really vibrant studio where people work together, like people really consider 
at family. It's so important, I think, for young people to be working with their hands these days. You know, everybody's down on a screen. Um, so just getting in and like making art and working together. We're a women led organization, you know, so like we've got that mentality. And um, I think it's really important, um, you know, and, and also, you know, we've, we've got, you know, young black people who are teaching and leading uh, leaders in the space. And I think that that's really important too, especially with, you know, the historic whiteness of glass. Um, these are just a couple more shots of our, our young folks in the space. And um, yeah, that's, that's my talk. Thank you so much, Pro. That was incredible. I learned a lot myself and it's amazing how this create was created and continues today. So I'm really honored to, to know you and to share the story with everybody and get the word out because it's definitely an important message, especially in the concept of this exhibition, because I, we talked about you and I, the future of the art world has to support the community as well, not beyond just the arts. And this is what you do on a daily basis. So thank you again. Thank you. And thank you guys all for, um, for listening, for caring, for being here, for what you all do. Um, yeah, I appreciate it. Should I take this off? Yeah, go ahead and stop sharing. So <laughs> I don't know if anybody wants uh how do I do. Okay. Okay, great. So Perel, it's Judy. I didn't get to say hello before Hi, Judy. I was muted. Thank you for this amazing presentation. Why would it not be amazing? It is what you are. <laughs> amazing. Honored to know you. Love you. Happy New Year. Thank, Thank you. you so and, much. and a shout out to Mort Silverman, our fellow <laughs> Chicagoan, who I saw a minute ago, who worked so yeah, much Chicago. with your with your studio. So thank you. Thank you so much, Judy. I really appreciate that. And you and Bruce have like, you've, you've been a big help. You guys have supported the, our studio too. And Morton Canaret and Larry, Dr. Wolin there, you know, there's a lot of folks on this call that have really supported me all throughout. Um, so thank you guys. You, you are inspiring and, and your art is gorgeous also. <laughs> so congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I miss you guys. Are you in Florida? We'll be home yes, in the spring. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> enjoy your beautiful, <laughs> enjoy your beautiful sunshine. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Miss you, Pearl. Miss you too. Really. I, you know, we, we actually, um, we opened up again. We've been um, in their blown glass and Mort can tell you, I mean, this poor guy and Canary, you were a saint for, you know, staying with him all through pandemic. I know, I know what a pain he can be. Um, especially when you can't blow glass. <laughs> so, for those of you who don't know, Mort Silverman is a glass collector here in Chicago, but he's also um, he's also a student, and he comes in and he blows glass with me. And all through pandemic, you know, obviously we couldn't have people in the space, and you know, we folks and Larry Wolin also blows glass in our studio. Um, he's also Chicago representing. And, and we couldn't have people in, we couldn't have young people in, we couldn't have like our community there. It was really, really difficult um, to, to go through that. And we had opened back up again and, you know, here we are getting hit and, you know, we have to close some things down again a bit, yeah. Well, I wanted to share um, a couple of quick things before we part today. So Pearl obviously is our January um, uh, presenter for not Grandma's Glass, which has been updated. You can see her here. This will be her exhibition. You can click on it and see her page. So Pearl and I are also fundraising for... Uh, um, Fire, Firebird. Firebird, Community thank Arts. you. Community of yep. Arts. So we're gonna be, if anybody purchases the work, they're all online, but 20% of the purchase price goes towards Firebird, which is a great way of supporting the community and supporting the artists. And this presentation will be right here on the Not Grandma's Glass website, the one we're looking at and talking about right now for the future. And you can see the past year up here at the archive button for 2021's um, 12 artists. And it's kind of fun to keep their archive alive while the uh, 2022 goes into play. We're still tweaking the site as uh, time goes by and hopefully it'll be all hammered out real soon. But that wraps it up. Thank you guys for joining me today. Thank you, Pearl, for being here today and joining us. I look forward to seeing everybody real soon, uh, possibly in Florida uh, for our Glass Coast Weekend event and then uh, on our next Zoom event. And uh, really great that these Zooms continue and you guys still join me. And it's great having you all here. Happy Thank birthday. You.
Thank you. Thank you. Have a great birthday party. Thanks, guys. Take care. Thank Have you a good so one. Bye. Okay, bye. 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 Be well. Okay. Be safe. Be warm. Be well.